Jesus, give us a sign. This asked the Pharisees to the man who was the greatest sign given by the Father to mankind. And after having witnessed the many miracles, they dared to ask that man, give us a sign. That's why Jesus answers in a clear way, no sign will be given to this generation. Which generation? That generation that had not allowed itself to be spiritually regenerated by she who was mother, Mary most holy. Even she is sign, given by the Father to indicate to mankind of that time, the first advent of the only begotten Son of God in the history of man. A sign ignored by those men. A sign that has become a stumbling block. Here today the Gospel proposes to us, on this particular day, which is also the last Sunday of August, this month in which we celebrated Mary, assumed into heaven. And this day when it also marks an anniversary so dear to our hearts, the opening to the public of the little cradle of the baby Jesus on the last Sunday of August in 1975. Here's the sign. This cradle, the cradle of God. The tabernacle of the eternal infant, the sign given to humanity in these hard and difficult times given by the Father to mankind, so that humanity can recognize Him, set out on the journey, repent, if one wants, to be able to live and love He who is, who here has descended, to dwell eternally, into the hearts of all those who love Him, said Jesus to Maria Giuseppina Norcia, she who welcomed the baby Jesus into her heart, she made herself living cradle to welcome the divine infant. She who with her example of life, has given us the way, to arrive in front of this little cradle, tracing for us the path that would allow us to meet the baby Jesus, to recognize the sign given by the Father. What did Jesus say? It is necessary that you approach this second and last grotto of mine, because there will never be another. Here's the sign. Here's the love in which the Father spoke to her, in order to speak to our hearts, and many were the signs that God has operated in this corner of paradise. And who went to honor the Son of God? The learned, the wise, the priests? No! The simple and humble went, the little ones, those who were considered by the world to be the ones far from God, and who instead demonstrate and have demonstrated once again, of having a ready heart, willing to welcome the newness of God, that in this land wanted to manifest himself. Here it is that on the example of that Canaanite woman, of which the pontiff, last Sunday wanted to speak to us, in his wonderful homily. So many from far away have arrived here and have met God. God. God, the true God, not what others wanted us to believe was God. That true, living God. Who makes himself everything and everyone? And many have come here to ask, a bodily healing, spiritual. And to these God bestowed the sign that they were asking for. Because to them, God gives all of himself. He gave a part of his heart, the infant Jesus here descended from heaven, living bread descended from heaven, to be broken, to become for those who desire, the substantial and essential life-giving nourishment. Here is that God who advances, that God who shortens the distance between heaven and earth. That God who runs the risk of the earth, once again for love runs this risk. This is the infinite love of God. Here is the mystery of the grain of wheat, sown by the Father, hidden in this land of love, to make fructify and to make so many hearts sprout to life, to make many hearts sprout to new life, make many hearts, who recognize that grain, that holy leaven of God, that here in this land, who again mixes himself, into the mass, to make it grow. And all those who recognize that yeast and in that bread Christ, the Son of God, they turn, they change their life, they transform their lives from a continuous succession of monotonous events, into something extraordinary of unique, we have met the Lord. This comes from the heart of who truly arrives in front of this cradle, meets the baby Jesus, recognizes that holy yeast, and lets it enter his little heart, be transformed in totality. This is the miracle that takes place in front of this cradle, 
where we all find ourselves on that boat, and we recognize in him who boarded the boat, the Son of God. It is again the Son of God who has boarded this boat, has made of this boat, of this ark his mystical body, the universal Christian church of the New Jerusalem, the only church that leads to salvation, the only beacon of recognition of the Father's love, the only beacon of light of Christianity, the only place where Christ becomes bread again, to feed his children in a living communion, a communion of heart, of soul, and spirit. Spirit. It is the spirit that gives life, the flesh doesn't benefit anything. This is what one must understand, to be able to turn in totality. Behold then that the Son of God again, wanted this boat to go offshore, to sail away from a shore where the Pharisees once again, dared to defy God, by promoting a doctrine far from the teachings of Jesus, affirming that it is not necessary to be baptized in Christ, in order to become a son of God, for all are God's children. And that proselytism is a solemn nonsense. Thereby debasing the sacrifice of Christ, of most holy Mary and of many saints and martyrs of Christianity. That's why the Lord in time and for time has wanted to turn. He took over his boat, his church, so that the underworld would not prevail on his church. And he wanted to take this boat so that he could lead it to another shore. Just as we have read in this passage from the Gospel, the shore of the White Island, the shore of the New Jerusalem, that shore where the sons, the little ones, the last, the distant, can again concretely experience the living presence of God in their midst, can finally live this God, without all those weights, those burdens, that others have placed on the shoulders of the sons of God, turning hearts away from the true religion willed by the Father. Behold, that here in this land, the Spirit blows, to make rediscover the beauty of the only religion wanted by the Father. That religion that must inflame hearts, must raise up true witnesses, true worshippers of God in spirit and truth. Not a stale old religion of people who are dead inside, who have nothing more to convey, because they haven't met God, because they did not want to welcome the newness of God. This is the truth, dear brothers, sisters. This is what must excite our hearts and must make us turn in totality, because the others may recognize in us the sign of the baby Jesus, a living, indelible, eternal sign that we can touch with hand in these young people who populate this church, who live this church. Young people who are assigned for so many other young people. Numerous young people who will arrive, and that will find here, their everything. Dear young people, remain pure. Persevere on this path and you will marvel at what God will do even through you. Because God wants to do great things. God did not call us to weigh ourselves down further but to make us feel that freedom that makes us to be sons, to make us feel alive within. That freshness that is of young people, that must belong to everyone, not only those who are young anagraphically, but those who make themselves small, in order to be able to welcome the newness of God. We shouldn't worry of the one bread that we have brought on this boat. So as we read in this passage, the disciples of Jesus were concerned about the only bread they had because they thought it couldn't be enough to feed everyone. Let us not worry about this, because that one, Christ, will feed everyone. Here is the mystery of the baby Jesus. Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand him on that boat, trying to get them to perceive a reality that was only possible to perceive on a spiritual level. That's why Jesus at one point tells them, but don't you have ears to hear, you have eyes and you do not see, you have ears and you do not hear. So he is talking about something beyond the perception of the senses. They could not fully understand it those brothers, because that sign was for those who would be called to live the last times, when would be fulfilled, another multiplication of the loaves. You see the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, talk about two multiplication of the loaves, unlike the other two Gospels. Well, Jesus in this Gospel passage in the discourse that he gives to his own, 
He takes up those two multiplications, and he reminds them, he says, Have you forgotten of when I multiplied the loaves for five thousand men, for four thousand men, how many baskets were left? Twelve, seven, very well. Then what is Jesus talking about? Why does he make this speech? Actually, he wants to make those friends of his understand that before their eyes something very special is taking place, a third multiplication of the loaves. That makes us understand the plan of love and redemption of the Father that in history is fulfilled. Behold, if in the course of the first covenant, the manna had been necessary in the desert, and if in the course of the second covenant, it had been necessary to seal it with the visible sign of the Eucharistic bread, hear that in the third covenant, that Father now has stipulated with this church, it is necessary to go beyond, for everything to be fulfilled. In order to fulfill the words of Jesus, that when he spoke of the living bread descended from heaven, said, It is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh is of no avail. Making us understand that the covenant that was sanctioned, with that visible sign, would then be brought to fulfillment in an invisible, spiritual sign. Hear then that everything now has to be fulfilled in an exclusively spiritual key in order to be able to reach the fullness of that communion that we are all called to live, no longer an outward sign, but an interior sign, indelible because eternal. Here then we also understand the profound meaning of Jesus' speech to the Samaritan when he said, There will come a time when neither on this mountain. Which one? The one where there was Jacob's well, that marked the first covenant with God's chosen people, nor in Jerusalem that marked the second covenant instead, because let us not forget that in Jerusalem, the Son of God accomplishes his sacrifice, in that sacrifice, the covenant with the Christian people is sanctioned. But in the new Jerusalem, here, here is this mountain where the Father has wanted to stipulate his third covenant. And the true worshipers of God in spirit and truth, are called here to come to worship God in spirit and truth, to be able to come to the understanding of whole truth, just as Jesus had promised, that truth that cannot be obscured by anything or anyone, as Jesus revealed to the woman of God. Jesus said, in this new temple, neither the Sanhedrin, the leaven of the Pharisees, nor the world, the leaven of Herod, will have authority. For I preserved it solely for me, for what is to be fulfilled. His, our Mass, the world will not understand. But those who are called to live this Mass must understand this living Mass well, continuous and palpitating, a Mass that can be lived only if one lives as a saint, only if one lives true brotherhood, only if one truly changes one's own life, without always looking at the brother to look for the flaw in brother, the lack in brother, but trying to always question oneself before God and not be like the Pharisees who always think they are right, of always being on the side of reason, of always being able to teach others the truths. Let us be humble, little, on the example of those who followed Jesus on the example of the shepherds in Bethlehem, who recognized the sign and set out, following the example of the Magi who found Jesus, because they wanted to find him and want to find Jesus, doesn't mean simply to put one's feet in this cradle. It means putting oneself totally in discussion, because one can come to the cradle of the baby Jesus, but remain just as one is, impervious to the grace of God, just as the Pharisees were. We must turn away this Pharisaical spirit. That's why Jesus invited us with love and with strength, keep away the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees. Here is that leaven, those bad feelings, those teachings that distance from the true teachings of God. We know that yeast dissolving disappears in the Mass. That's why Jesus warns us, with respect to this yeast, because he well understands that that yeast can ruin the whole dough. Because if the yeast is bad, it ruins the dough and the dough must be thrown away, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here then is the love of Jesus, the exhortation of Jesus, to beware of that subtle deception, which on a personal spiritual level, can happen that way I was telling you before, 
but at a general level occurs when the two powers, religious and political, come together in order to go against God's project. Here is that subtle deception artfully constructed by the religious power, the Pharisees, and by a part of the political power, Herod, in order to be able to destroy in the bud the project of God thus killing in the bud so many innocent souls who can now have the grace to be able to live the new Jerusalem. Here, dear brothers, we are happy, joyful, we have our hearts in heaven, because we have received this great call from God to be able to live this new Jerusalem. And we have the grace that we may live as a true family of God, so that the many may join this family, many distant, many lost in the world, who have not had the grace that we have had, and that are in search of the truth, who here is revealing itself in full form, to so many of those who are on the way and who will arrive I say, come, come quickly, do not make Jesus wait, come and take that slice of love he has reserved for each of you. Don't let yourself be stopped by so many blind guides and who do not see and do not want to make see. Don't deprive yourself of the joy of being able to see with your own eyes that living bread, here descended from heaven, to feed the people. Here you will feel like sons, children of God, children of Mary, who awaits you here to embrace you and to hold you close to her heart, to make you win for eternity, now and always.